Imagine being invited to a dinner party thrown by someone who was well known for killing their dinner guests. Well, that is exactly the situation that the guests would have been in who were invited to the Black Banquet, thrown by the Roman Emperor Domitian. Where even the food served was black, like this Roman patina or frittata with jellyfish and cuttlefish ink. So thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video as we make a rather ghastly dish for a ghastly banquet, this time on Tasting History. So as I researched this bizarre and frankly creepy dinner from Roman history, I wondered what dish could I find that was just as bizarre and frankly creepy. And then I saw fellow food history nerd Andrew Coletti make this dish over on TikTok. He goes by the name Pass the Flamingo over there. He's fantastic and he does lots of wonderful old Roman and, and other historic dishes. But I just knew this is what I had to make. So as with most ancient Roman recipes, this one comes from Apicius, and he has a number of recipes for what are called patina, which is like a frittata or a casserole. And the one previous to this dish in the book is called a patina of anchovies, whereas this one is a patina of anchovies without anchovies. Take flesh of roasted or boiled fish and flake, enough to fill a dish the size you want. Grind pepper and a little roux. Soak with enough garum and mix in a little oil, and break eggs and mix everything in the pan with the fish, so that it makes a smooth mixture. On top, you gently place jellyfish, so they do not mix with the eggs. Cook in steam so that the jellyfish cannot combine with the eggs, and when they are dry, sprinkle with ground pepper and serve. At the table, no one will know what they are eating. <laughs> Why would he write that? So creepy. Anyway, I thought it was kind of perfect for a dish for the Black Banquet. Though if you're looking for some non-creepy dishes, and frankly quite delicious dishes, then look no further than today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Now I love food all year round, but we are heading into my favorite season of eating, because fall is culinarily the best. And HelloFresh has exactly the kind of seasonal recipes that I enjoy making at home, like brown sugar bourbon beef tenderloin and scallops over butternut squash risotto. And after driving around town all day looking for jellyfish, it's really nice to come home to all of the ingredients for a proper dinner delivered to my door. And they're all pre-portioned out, so I don't even have to do a lot of prep work. I can get right to the cooking. Last night I made the pork sausage rigatoni. It has fresh zucchini and a creamy sauce with cheese. And like many of the meals from HelloFresh, it can be made in just 30 minutes. And like all of their meals, it was scrumptious. They also have this option where you can swap in and out different proteins or sides or even add more protein, so you're always getting the meal that you really want. So go to HelloFresh.com and use my code TASTINGHISTORY65 to get 65% off plus free shipping. That's 65% off plus free shipping when you use my code TASTINGHISTORY65 at HelloFresh.com. And I assure you, with HelloFresh you will always know what you are eating, unlike the dish that we're about to make. Though, I'm about to tell you exactly what's in it, so brace yourself. About one pound of white flaky fish, four to six eggs, two tablespoons of olive oil, plenty of black pepper, one teaspoon of roux. Now I talked about this rather infamous herb in a recent video on ancient Roman gardens, and if you don't have fresh roux at home, because most people don't, you can get it dried online, and I'll put a link in the description to where you can find that, along with a link to where you can get garum, the ancient Roman fish sauce. You'll need about one tablespoon for this as well as jellyfish. Now the ancient Greeks and Romans were baffled by jellyfish, as frankly so am I. Their aquatic undulations earned them the nickname pulmo marinus, or marine lung. And naturalists often had trouble deciding if they should classify it as a plant or an animal. The writer Polybius just ended up saying that they were a compound of land, sea, and air. This close to being the avatar. Though as perplexing as they were, they were also highly desirable. Aristotle said, in wintertime their flesh is firm, and accordingly they are sought after as articles of food. But in summer weather they are worthless, for they become thin and watery, and if you catch them, they break at once into bits. Now as this dish is meant for the black banquet, where everything was black, and we'll discuss that later, 
I am going to add one ingredient, but it was an ingredient that was used by the ancient Romans, and that is cuttlefish ink. And you really don't need very much, just a tiny spoonful usually dissolved into wine or water, but for this recipe, I'm dissolving it into an extra egg because adding more liquid to this is not gonna be good. Now to start, the recipe calls for the fish to be boiled or roasted, and you can do it either way, really kind of depends on what fish you are using. I have tilapia because that's pretty much all that was available at the store when I went for some reason, and I just roasted it at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes, and then it's easy to pull apart into flakes. Separately, grind the pepper in a mortar and then add the chopped roux and grind until combined. Then add them to the oil and the garum and stir until everything is mixed. Then he says to put the fish into the dish that you are using. And if you're using a, a nice big dish, you can, you can absolutely do that, but it might end up making a mess. So I'm putting it into a bowl where then I'll cover it with the garum and the oil and then pour in the eggs and beat everything together until well combined. And then if you're using the cuttlefish or squid ink, now is the time to add it. It becomes rather nightmarish. Then very gently place the jellyfish on top, doing your best to not have it sink into the eggs. This is why the hood of the jellyfish really works best because you can just kind of set it on top and it floats. These do tend to fall, so you kind of have to make like a, a lattice work. It's, it's kind of gross. Then place that dish into a larger dish or a deep pan and fill it with hot water and then put that into the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 180 Celsius for about 20 to 25 minutes. It's going to kind of depend on the size of the dish that you end up using, but you just cook it until the eggs are nice and firm. Though the jellyfish will actually kind of liquefy, so the center, wherever they are, there still might be some liquid. Now, before we can sit down and eat this black dish meant for the black banquet, I think it's important that I introduce you to the host. The Emperor Domitian came into office in the year 81, succeeding his father and his brother, both really tough acts to follow. His father was the Emperor Vespasian, considered quite a good emperor, especially after what came before him. There was Nero, quite despised, and then three complete failures during the tumultuous year of four emperors, Vespasian being the fourth. And then after a prosperous decade of ruling Rome, he died and left his eldest son, Titus, to take over. Now Titus was only emperor for two years, but during that short period of time, he recaptured Jerusalem, completed construction of the Colosseum, and proved quite generous in relieving the suffering of the survivors of Mount Vesuvius. So when he unexpectedly died of a fever, the Roman Senate deified him. So then you have to put yourself into Domitian's shoes, who's now becoming the new emperor. Your father was a great hero, your brother a literal god. Pretty much anything you do at this point is going to pale in comparison. And the thing is, we actually don't know all that much about what he did do. And he was, he was ruling for 15 years, quite a long time. But we don't know much about it because instead of deifying him when he died, the Senate decided that his name should be obliterated from the history books. His name was stricken from official documents, his face was painted over, or in the case of statues, smashed or rechiseled to look like the next emperor, Nerva. Pliny the Younger actually joined in the destruction. How delightful it was to smash to pieces those arrogant faces, to raise our swords against them, to cut them ferociously with our axes, as if blood and pain would follow our blows. Now, Domitian is far from the only Roman emperor to have this done to him. Others included Commodus, Nero, and Caligula. But the erasing of Domitian's legacy from the history books seems particularly effective. Much of what we know about him comes either from much later authors or from contemporary authors who just didn't really like him all that much. Everything written about him had to go. Unless you were writing mean things about him, those could stay. Only recently have historians begun to, if not clear his name, then at least dust it off a bit. He's now kind of seen as, yes, he was ruthless, but he was also very effective as a ruler and laid the groundwork for the next century of prosperity and relative peace. Some say he should get as much credit as emperors like Trajan and Hadrian, but that may be going a little bit too far. Now, while the senatorial and equestrian class despised him, he did have his fans. Most of the military really liked him, and it seems that the majority of the populace liked him as well. 
The problem is that the army and most of the population are just too busy living to write stuff down. That was done by the upper class. And as I always say, history is not written by the victors, it's written by those who write stuff down. And so with few exceptions, it is the cruel, paranoid, sociopathic, tyrannical Domitian that we read about in the history books. And honestly, that's kind of what makes him interesting. Nobody likes a goody two-shoes. Now, the fullest account of Domitian's reign comes from Suetonius, who admits that the early part of the emperor's reign was actually quite good for Rome, and only later did things go downhill. But they went downhill. See, Roman emperors were de facto monarchs, all powerful, but they had to maintain the idea of Roman democracy, that the Senate was really in charge of the government and just allowing the emperor to do whatever they wanted to do. Unfortunately, Domitian was not good at pretending, and so he said, no, I, I, I'm, I'm in charge, I get to do whatever I want, and I hate the Senate. In fact, I'm going to take away the little powers that they do have. He was very public about it, and so he despised them. They despised him. But he was emperor, so they couldn't really do much to harm him, but he could do stuff to harm them, literally. He actually is credited with killing a number of senators and people from the senatorial class. And just like Pringles, once you pop, you can't stop. And so he quickly expanded the victims that he had and started just killing all sorts of people. After the famous actor Paris was accused of having an affair with Domitian's wife, he had him dragged out into the street and murdered. But what really shocked people was that he also had one of Paris's students, a, a young boy, murdered as well because he kind of looked like Paris. And when a man at the gladiatorial games made a comment about Domitian favoring the Thracian over the Mermillo, he had the man dragged from his seat and thrown into the arena to the dogs. Suetonius said his savage cruelty was not only excessive, but also cunning and sudden. And he accused the emperor of taking pleasure in toying with those that he had condemned to death. He never pronounced an unusually dreadful sentence without a preliminary declaration of clemency, so that there came to be no more certain indication of a cruel death than the leniency of his preamble. And while Domitian was known for being generous and throwing lavish dinners, accepting an invitation might not be the best thing to do. Once he invited one of his stewards to his chambers, made him sit beside him on the couch, putting him in a secure and pleasant frame of mind, even deigning to give him a share of his dinner. Then the next day, he had the man crucified. And this was a pattern of behavior, and surely one lingering in the back of the minds of those senators when they received invitations to a banquet at the palace. Now, the man who wrote of this dinner, Cassius Dio, wasn't even born until 60 years after Domitian's death. So while it may be true, there could also have been some dramatic license taken. But with that said, here's the story. It was around the year 90, well into the sadistic phase of Domitian's reign, and a number of people in the senatorial and equestrian class get an invitation from a man who has fairly recently killed many of their friends, colleagues, and family. But it's the emperor and it's Domitian, so you can't turn this invitation down. So with trepidation, they all attend. And when they walk in, they look around and realize that their feelings of dread and foreboding are very well founded. The emperor had prepared a room that was pitch black on every side, ceiling, walls, and floor. Then he invited his guests in, alone, at night, without their servants. Now, while the black decor was certainly unsettling, it was actually the fact that they couldn't bring their servants in that probably really started to sound alarm bells. And that's because your servant, usually a slave at that time, would have gone with you everywhere when you were out in public, especially a banquet. But they all go in as they are told and sit down. And beside each of them is a lamp, but the kind that was usually used in tombs. Each guest also had an accompanying gravestone with their name carved into it. And then a group of boys, nude and painted black, entered as if they were phantoms. And after passing around the guests in a kind of terrifying dance, 
took up their stations at their feet. And then the meal comes out, and everything is served in black dishes, and the food itself all black. And the food is food often prepared for funerals, food for the dead. Consequently, every single one of the guests feared and trembled, and every moment felt certain that he was to be slain, especially as, on the part of everyone save Domitian, there was dead silence, as if they were already in the realm of the dead. And the emperor himself limited his conversation to matters pertaining to death and slaughter. It must have seemed like a long dinner, if nothing else, but eventually dinner was over, and he dismissed them. They, they were all alive. They had all survived this dinner. And so th they go out to the entrance to, to meet their servants who weren't allowed in, but their servants are all gone. And they've all been replaced with slaves who they don't know. And Cassius Dio says that even more than the creepy dinner, by this act, he filled them with far greater fear. Remember, these men knew Domitian's reputation for feigning mercy just before striking the death blow. So the fact that they were allowed to leave and even head home was probably of very little comfort. But they all did make it home. And after a while, they probably thought, okay, well, that was weird, but, but I'm okay. And then there's a knock at the door. There's a messenger from the emperor. While they were expecting, as a result of this, that now, at last, they should surely perish, one person brought in the gravestone from dinner. But it had been washed off, and it wasn't a gravestone at all. It was made of pure silver. And the dishes were brought in as well, but again, they were no longer black, but proved to be made of some costly material. Finally came that particular boy who had been each one's familiar spirit, now washed and well-dressed. Thus, while in terror all night long, they received their gifts. So in this case, yes, Domitian was cruel and tortured his guests, but he didn't kill them, at least not that night. Pretty, pretty likely that, that some of them were, were killed later because he still had a lot of killing to do. Now, I do wonder if this whole dinner was contrived kind of as a way of Domitian projecting his own paranoia onto others, making them feel what he always felt, because he was always paranoid. He used to say that the lot of emperors was most unfortunate, since when they discovered a conspiracy, no one believed them unless they had been murdered. And that's exactly what happened. In the year 96, his enemies and some of his friends actually got together and stabbed him to death. And the Senate rushed to declare Nerva the new emperor and decided that Domitian's name should be abolished from history, even making it so he couldn't have his name engraved on a headstone. And I kind of wonder if that wasn't a, you know, a little getting back at you for having our names engraved on headstones at that dinner. Now, while there are no headstones for us, we do still have a dish to try. And I do mean we, because I don't know that I can do this alone. And here we are, an ancient Roman patina with jellyfish. Thing is, it's not really black anymore, it's, it's more of a, a purplish. It smells like, like what it should smell like. It smells like the kind of the fish, but then, you know, that garum adds a, another layer uh, to that, and then a lot of pepper. Uh, you sprinkle the top with pepper, it has pepper in it. Um, yeah, I'm just putting this off. Let's do it. Okay. That's a lot of texture. It's a lot of texture. Um, none of none of the none of the textures are, are good. So had some fish in there, and that's really the flavor that's coming through is just the fish, um, but but more pungent than than the fish should be. I think because of the that, that garum. The problem is the the texture of that jellyfish. It's like cartilage. It's really soft and chewy yet firm, like much more firm than you want it to be. Like, it, you can't bite through it. I tried. Um, 
you just you just got to swallow it down. You can't, you can't bite through it. Um, it it's... They're... Mm. See, if they, it's just so... It's a texture that I don't care for, is, is what it is. I'll just, I'll just put it like that. Now, this is not the first black-colored food that I have had on the channel. I've had several others, including the melasomos, which was also questionable. And then I also had the feijoada, which was absolutely delicious. So if you want to see more black-colored food, watch one of those videos. And I will see you next time on Tasting History. It's so wibbly. Mm.